My conversation today is with veteran practitioner and host of the Magic Without Fears Hermetic podcast, Frater R.C. Among several other topics, he and I sat down today to talk about the Golden Dawn tradition of magic, with which he is intimately familiar, the angelic sessions of John D. and Edward Kelly, and podcasting, as he has been host and interviewer to some of the most well-respected and serious practitioners in the magical and occult communities spanning several generations and lineages. We also spoke about the 2024 Enochia Con, which Frater R.C. has organized and is taking place this July in Vancouver, Canada, where he's based. Though only having recently met Frater R.C., I can say I found an easy friend and kindred spirit. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. Very good. Very good. All right. Awesome. I am so stoked that you are here right now, Frater RC, uh, from the uh, Magic Without Fears Hermetic Podcast. Uh, we just started talking recently, but, um, you know, I'm a fan of your work. You've been listening to the pod, which I really appreciate. And we've got a lot of areas of, uh, you know, confluence and, and harmony and, and, uh, I'm just happy to be able to talk to you. Now, the one thing that I want to start off with uh, for my listeners is um, when did you, like, how did you get into magic and the occult? What, when was, when did you know that you're like, okay, I'm committed to this? The commitment came after a, a forest fire disaster we had in Penticton, British Columbia. This was 94. And we had to get, rushed out of the pizza hut we were in i i guess i would have been 13 14 and uh the whole mountain range was on fire and this the city was in in imminent fear of evacuation as one of the biggest is that home home burning disasters all up it's one of the biggest fire disasters we've had we've had a lot more since of course but that this one's still uh charts and i was watching the fires and the flames just it was it was godlike right it was just absolutely overwhelming and as i was doing that we're just watching it from our campsite on our our summer vacation all of a sudden like i just while i was watching the fire and i'd been meditating for years doing transcendental meditation by at this point but not not much else um at all i didn't really you know other than that for me it was mostly you know Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering and stuff in those in those early 90 years but watching that fire up there and just something came alive and I actually felt like all of a sudden my whole like the space around me just opened up and there was like fire all around me and there's like fire above my head and I was like there's this light on above my head and I think something switched on that just the next day I woke up and I was like there's a voice in my head said you're going to be an occultist you have to be an occultist i was like what does that mean i didn't even know what the, it meant i'd sure i'd come across the word but no clue really uh, i know my mom had a book by rudolf steiner called the outline of occult science but i had no idea what it was this, let alone how it connected to the the waldorf school i was attending and uh that day we met up with her boyfriend who was like top one of the top dogs in amwork and he, he took us to her a cult shop that his friend owned and i bought celtic magic by dj conway and a bunch of little potions and oils and ointments and we all bought lots of books and uh, i just didn't stop reading i had already by that point when i was 10 lived in an oto oasis so i wasn't i don't know the, the the vibe was already strong in my life and again getting initiated at like age seven and ten into the in the ceremonies for transcendental meditation like, like those are full initiations like you're it's like whether you look at is it ancestor magic or attuning the meditator to the spirits of the mantra which is something i don't want to say more than that because i don't want to spoil tm for those who are still taking it very seriously um and there's nothing wrong with it as far as i can tell um, the organization of course has the same problems as any human groups but yeah so that was the moment uh that the commitment and the path and the calling uh hit me like a lightning bolt and never changed yeah but my interest of course there was some interest there before that i just was too young and didn't know enough to make sense of it i guess yeah that is very young that's very young I, and i feel like 
you know, I'm I'm like almost jealous that he got in so young because there's I personally feel like I I started behind the eight ball. I mean, I started reading about this stuff. I want to say just out of high school or maybe like my senior year of high school. Um, but you know, it's like you have to wade through that period of. Uh, I don't know what I believe. And then there's so many different, there's, there's so many different competing. I want to say, you know, perceptual softwares that you are unaware of, you know, like I, I, I like you got to get through the whole psychologization thing and realize like, oh, that's a thing. That's not actually how it was, you know, before the 19th century, uh, you know, and then you're trying to figure out, well, uh, is it this whole reenchantment thing? And then, how am I, you know, trying to filter magic through this postmodern kind of thing that I've just been literally like steeped in, like like a bag of tea, uh, you know, like my my entire young adult life. So it took took a long time, and I, I know that it takes a long time for a lot of people to kind of figure that stuff out and get all the cognitive dissonance kind of like just knocked out of their head. Um, so I'm sure that 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 probably put you on really good um, footing for for just being able to spend your adult years i'm assuming right kind of just getting to to where you are now a little bit more of a of an informed and scholarly approach but also a practitioner yeah the academic stuff didn't come along really until early 2000s i was reading things like francis yates in in the late 90s and 2000 because it was uh it, it was being republished in very accessible and popular ways mm -hmm. um but the academic side like i didn't start reading things like antoine fevre and 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 hanagraf and jocelyn godwin until i closed after i closed temple to hootie in 2003 four and uh so yeah, no, I was I I went my entire career in the Golden Dawn without being even really remotely aware of the academic study of Western esotericism. I mean, obviously, you see some of these guys' names in their books, in the store, and then you look at it and it looks really dense, and you're like, oh, this is a boring writer. Where's you know, where's his exercises for telekinesis? You yeah, know? and and you don't really rock that it's a university thing, like that this is actually a university peer reviewed book, and you're like, once you realize that and what that is and what that means, you're like, oh they're they're really taking this stuff seriously that's actually kind of cool maybe i can learn something from that but from 1996 when i was initiated into neophyte at temple Tehuti, to 1999 when i tested into portal in my 12th year of high grade 12 year of high school and then wow. as an adept wow. 18 months later five six i was nine 18 months in portal um, and had to double my working for that to to really work through stuff because I was so young and and I'm glad I wasn't initiated in five six at nineteen. It makes sense that I I had I was waited till I was twenty. They were waiting for me to like have girlfriends and have a life and, and mature yes. in certain ways that I was holding off on. What they didn't realize was like I was staying a virgin intentionally because of all the stuff I'd read about virgins <laughs> being better scryers, and so and my psychic senses were pretty were pretty on point, honestly, to the point that I could demonstrate stuff to people very very well and always knew who was calling on the phone even if they were supposed to be out of town you know that I, sort of stuff was very gotta, prominent I, in my life i gotta tell you and i, I have to support that that thing when i take uh, you know people will roll their eyes they'll scoff they'll laugh i don't really give a shit um but the the truth is when i am completely abstinent for long periods of time and things like that you know um i am more in tune I'm more intuitive. Um, I it's just more available to me now. I mean, I didn't get into practical magic before I, you know, kind of that ship had sailed, virginity, you know, type of thing. So, yeah. uh, so I don't know what it would be like, but but that must have been an incredible and overwhelming experience for a young guy. Well, it's certainly the 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 like the, the progress that me and my little high school Wiccan coven of two buddies uh were able to make in seeing how far we could take these things was phenomenal and uh remarkable and gave and solidified me in the the, the experience that that this stuff was all very real like seeing spirits for real outside your circle on midsummer sabbath celebration where you're, you know you're doing your your high school coven thing like that's not psychological. So <laughs> when the whole psychological thing became understanding magic reared its ugly head, I was a little surprised and confused by it. 
but now I understand it. I know where it came from. I know how it developed. And, uh, and it's like, now my take on that is if you want to think it's all in your head psychologically, we can't just say all in your head after Lon Milo has clarified that he agrees with Stephen Skinner yeah. on my podcast, right? Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't believe in psycho the psychological model. So, but if that model's fine, because if you're doing everything right, then, and well, inevitably, you'll probably have that dispelled if you're meant to, right? You know, if you do it well enough, long enough, you'll probably have a spirit turn up or, or get some, uh, some phenomena that convince you otherwise, or at least suggest otherwise. And then if, if and then if you're still, like if you still need to cling on to that psychological model, you'll probably just think you're losing your mind. <laughs> you Maybe, know? but I think also Israel Regardi did an excellent job at demonstrating the psychological benefit of the system, regardless of your metaphysical views of it. And to me, that's one of the greatest things about Regardi. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know what? Another thing that he that he said was he he was kind of insisted on if you're going through this kind of stuff and you're having, you know, the alchemical initiations of the golden dawn, not just that, but just practicing magic in general, you should be seeing a psychotherapist, um, which, you know, he thought that those two tracks together would be very healthy. And I, I don't doubt that they are. Um, I'm not, sh I'm not sure that modern psychotherapy is, is, you know, in the, in the main, I'm not sure that it's anything more than behaviorism at this point. Um, I'm not, a, I'm also not a professional and I've, I've been out of therapy for a couple of years, so um, I don't really know, but, but I, I could see how those two things, you know, especially if you, could you imagine having Israel Regardy as like your psychotherapist? You know, like that would be such a blessing if you're a magician, because this guy would just, he'd not try to talk you out of it. You know? Yeah, I guess I was. I I did a, a year of therapy, and and then another year, ten years apart. The first time it was a, a guy who had, had a PhD and and specialized in un, academically in medieval mysticism. So we had a great time. Wow. Uh, especially after I'd worked through the trauma, and by the end, like the last few months, where we would just talk about like Meister Eckhart and stuff, and until eventually, I was like, I think this is we're good. And he's like, Yeah, I think we're good. Come visit sometime. And uh, and then you know, ten years later, I had to do another year and. That help you know i think talk therapy can help people get through uh trauma and catastrophe if especially if they don't have support networks or family to who are willing to uh listen uh so if you just don't have those things then then it can be really great and and of course i i can't even comment on really the quality of talk therapy i just don't know enough yeah i mean it it, it certainly did it did wonders for me at a certain at a certain point in my life. Um, absolutely, you know, I spent from the time I was about in fourth grade, I was uh, I had been in therapy all through high school and stuff like that, even in college. Um, so I'm not knocking it, but it's just it, it, one of the reasons why I, I'll sometimes kind of dig my feet about going, you know, dig my heels in about going back is like it. This is such a huge part of my life that like, how the hell am I not going to talk about? You know, it's like, it's like trying to hide. Um, I don't know. It's like trying to hide the fact that maybe like you're a paraplegic from your therapy. It's like, there's no way I can hide this from you. But it, to me, it sounds like you may have been sort of like made for this life. You, it, between all the kind of synchronicities and the experiences and things like that, it seems like this was kind of part of your life path, you know, from a, a really early age. Yeah, I think so. The, you know, it, uh, it it seems to be uh, part of what my mother calls my dharma, and uh, I I have a I've thought a lot about the course of my life, and uh, it's amazing how how much was influenced by health, honestly, and it's something I will dig into later at some point, but. Uh, you know, like, uh, I, I found out only in my early thirties that I had celiac disease. So when I went in puberty hit, I didn't understand why all of a sudden all my joints hurt, why I was putting on weight. I couldn't run anymore without my ankles giving out. And so I went from being like the, the, the athlete kid in the, in the school to being this fat, depressed goth kid, um, you know, hiding his head in Anne Rice in, in the hopes that the, my classmates in grade eight, the girls wouldn't all like decided to beat me up that recess because we were like two guys in our class and 10 girls. And so oh, wow. it got a bit rough. Um, so, you know, um, that was a dark period. My parents divorced and all that. And it was just, it was hell on earth and uh, magic really saved me. Spirituality saved me.
Yes. And I yeah. needed something different than transcendental meditation because that's what my parents did. That's what they brought me into. And when they divorced and stopped doing it, um, life was hellish for for a few years, especially with a wicked stepmother coming into the picture, like evil beyond belief. So wow. I could I couldn't turn to TM because it was mentally it was associated with all that. So I found my way to Celtic magic and and then just magic, just trying to understand what this magic thing is. Um, and that, of course, led me to the Golden Dawn. I, I, I couldn't learn it from books. You have to have people. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, how, did, how did podcasting get into it? I tried to do a few podcasts in like 2008 and 2019, but uh, didn't really seem to take off. And then, uh, then I started another one in 2020 early on because I was doing a presentation. I, I'm very honored to have been accepted by the PantheaCon panel and got to invited to go present there in 2020 in February, um, right when COVID hit. So I got the Delta variant the beginning on a Monday and was presenting on a Friday at PantheaCon, not knowing that I had just was still like probably contagious from the Delta variant. I didn't even know I had COVID at the time, um, but I did feel like I was dying. Um, so yeah, that was a, probably a super spreader event that I was very honored to be a part of. I did a presentation on uh, WB Yeats's Hermetic Order of Celtic Mysteries and had a great event. Got to hang out with Lon and Chicken Tabby. I got to like, yeah, chill with Chicken Tabby and Lon all at the same time. I'll send you a pic. We uh, we all got we all had a had a fireside chat about some of our favorite people in the world. You know, like David Griffin and others. <laughs> Yep, I would too, love to have been that's a fly not too on wild that for this wall, point. man. <laughs> I would love to have been a fly on that wall. But yeah, so I mean, you you're a Golden Dawn guy. Um, you know, um, I know most people know that about you. We were talking a bit about how the the tradition is kind of experiencing. I don't know what what is it a resurgence? I mean, what 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 is it? What's going on right now? I honestly think a lot of it is to do with. things opening up um and not i'm not talking about in the secular world in COVID and all that i'm talking about just in the traditions so we've had the traditions and the different branches of of the main branches of the order locked down for a very long time right there was this in in my day especially i'll i'll speak when i speak of the cicero group which which of course you're a part of i'm going to speak about it from the, the, my knowledge of it back in the day so this what what i heard about it because there wasn't much information going around uh, right. and most of what i knew was from gossip from people who were talking to them on the phones in our inner order and so uh, they weren't really recruiting at all of course and so uh you know hoggy and and homsy and eogd then we're recruiting hardcore and you know our order became had thousands of members in it and uh major temples and temple to the one that i ran it was over 125 active members 24 7 two temples inside massive beautiful everything in a horrible part of town the light in the darkness right next to the same strip club from deadpool and uh you know it was a, it was a wild experience but really beautiful and really everyone was very devoted to it but those traditions, the you know the 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 sort of zinc and Griffin and and uh, the other other branches, for whether it's Chris Manastra or now the orders temples connected with Zaleski, I think there just wasn't that many options. But those orders produced adepts, right? And a lot of those adepts moved on. Some of them stopped being interested in this stuff, but some of them didn't, right? Uh, like the amount of Golden Dawn adepts that are floating around BC and Canada. Uh, come they came out of Thuban Temple and are now just have no one to talk to or even connect with or work with is crazy. So most of them are probably just going to take those skills and apply them to the rest of their lives. That's what I was doing up until I came back on the scene in 2019, just applying what I knew to my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not a bad thing for a magician to do is just take their knowledge, gnosis, and skills and live their best life with it. You don't have to always be attached to these organizations. And like you were saying, with all the collecting sashes, that's not necessarily what it has to be. It's a wonderful part of it, especially if you really love the initiations and putting on the initiations and, and believe in that experience and sharing it with others. So now there's all these other people and they're creating groups and you have uh, independent 
uh, groups and temples that are springing up and creating more opportunities. Why there is more of a demand than we can fulfill is something I, I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe you have some ideas because there's way more people wanting to be initiated into go into a good, even even decent Golden Dawn temple than we could ever fulfill at present, right? Like if if me and my friends in town were to even put on initiations, we could never even tell anyone because there'd be we there'd be too many people who want to do it. And if you're sticking with one person, one candidate per initiation, which is probably the only way I'll do it ever again. Um, and we instituted that change while I was an adept at Tahuti. So, you know, and that was the right move, I think. I, I'm not I'm not opposed to group initiations. I don't think there's anything wrong with them, but they're not preferable. Yeah, especially on the the, you know, for lack of a better term, the astral load on the the, you know, the dais and stuff like that. You you're doing a lot of stuff up there. Um if you work in the Z formulas and it it it, it you know I don't know. Maybe I'm going to out myself as a little bit of a wuss, but it, it gets exhausting like quick. <laughs> so it's like, I'm like, uh, you know, marathon initiate our golden dawn day is like for, for, for the temple chiefs. I mean, it's basically, you know, it's 12 hour day almost, you know? So it's, it's, Oh yeah. And heaven help you. If it's like a, a three, eight or four, seven, and you haven't finished, finished all your lines. Like there's times, especially when you're running a full-time temple where you like your officers, fortunately are well-trained everyone, your crew of six months has been well honed, ready for that first four or seven. And you have to just lock yourself in your room, walk back and forth, reading the lines backwards and frontwards, however you can to memorize them. So you don't have that script on the, on the dais with you. Um, and it's yes. just it, th to memorize that amount of information sometimes in, in one or two days is incredible, but, I'm pleased to say you can do it. Yeah, well, that's what that was. Believe it or not, the, the the memory load thing actually came to me later on when I joined Freemasonry because, you know, there's you that is the real for me. That's the memory training right there. Um, in order to move move through, you know, um, I, and I'm not sh I'm not certain that it's this way in in every jurisdiction in in the states. But I, I know in mine you have to you have to complete proficiency, which is about you know fifteen minutes of uh, dialogue with a coach, completely from memory, um, in archaic English. You know, like English that no one uses anymore. But that really it really did help um, a lot of the the ritual work later on. And you know, yeah, when you get up to to those. I guess higher grades in the outer order where there are, you know, there are less officers, but there's more paths. So it's like you get it's you've got like three or four really solid people, but um, you know, after the you know, the, the second or third, you're just kind of like maybe you're warming up if you if you're doing, you know, an early four seven and then working your way down. But by the time you're doing like two or three neophytes, like the the middle of the day or the end of the day, you're just like, Jesus Christ, I'm exhausted. I got you know, I think I need like a are power you, are you, bar. You're actually talking about doing the zero zero three times in a row. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean we because yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll 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 do we'll yeah. do we'll do group initiations, but there's certain there's certain point because it's like like you're saying, the demand is too high. And you know, in a in a lot of ways it's like you have to you have to keep bringing in new neophytes as, as, as the demand uh, comes to the door. You know, I mean like chicks thing is chicks. Big thing is like, you got to give everybody a chance to come to the light. Um, so we do, you know, in we, the last we, few months, I got to say in the last few months of our temple, like our membership, before I closed it down, was going through the roof. Like we were having months where it was four members joining nine members, giant joining five members joining. Like we would have been at hundreds of members, which would have, given us the ability to change locations or do incredible things. It's just, uh, it felt, it just, it wasn't working. It wasn't. Yeah. And working. there's, there's certain points of that ritual where you, it has to be just the candidate, you know, you can't, you can't be, doing, that's what they say. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I can't do it any other way. There's certain points, you know, there's like the, the fourth and final purification and all that stuff. There's no way you can have like a bunch of people like holding each other's shoulders, <laughs> you know, like, like some, Speaking some other of, rituals. Yeah. Well, yeah, we would, we would sometimes, cause we were, if, if on the nights we did multiple, uh, initiations for like, if we had two people, we would sometimes finish one at 2am, you know, it'd be yeah. a lot, but, um, you know, I was one of those people that you hear about in the neophyte initiation, um, who was like incredibly psychic before it. And then as soon as like, after that whole, uh, the whole sword thing 
psychic senses gone felt more in my body than i ever had it like i felt like a prisoner in my body for the first time in my life mm. like there is no i'm not even a mind right i'm just this lump of flesh and that was that didn't shift back and that i didn't reawaken with my senses until uh three eight wow yeah yeah, yeah that, i mean that's that's crazy i i had shut a lot of that stuff off because i had i was scared when i was a kid i used to my parents divorced as well and um you know i would i felt completely insecure uh without my dad in the house and uh but we moved into this place that was yeah. just not it was not comfortable too much going on there i don't know what it was what kind of trauma was going on but i would see people in the hallways and stuff like that and it just scared the shit out of me and i i i had to shut it off in order to function as like you know a 13 year old like you don't have enough going on you know with puberty and 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 middle school and and things like that so but but it actually the floodgates opened after my 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 neophyte and then i would say probably once i hit portal they kind of closed back. Everything started to even out. Maybe probably four equals seven. The philosophers, everything started to kind of even out again. And and now I can kind of, I can access it. You know, I I've developed other techniques. I work a lot of uh, of like Taoist energy work. You know, that was there were like two parallel streams that just ran next to each other the entire time. It seemed kind of like we're talking a little it was my dharma to to do both of those at the same time and uh and so i i utilized those to kind of create my own coin each one being either side and 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 i kind of i i can access these things with with more control now um but it's it's just really interesting because i don't get to really talk i mean i talk to people that are in the golden dawn tradition but not like not at this level so this is a great conversation for me i'm really enjoying this yeah, like uh, we were saying before you hit record, it's 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 um, there's not that many people uh, who have ever lived to run a Golden Dawn temple at all, and uh, so it's fascinating to be able to talk with each other. I can only imagine the things we would all say if you got a group of us from different orders in person and just uh, hanging out. But hopefully, we'll you know we're working hard to create in person communities and events that will actually allow more uh, camaraderie and and sharing between uh, people. So hopefully that. Uh, happens when we get to hang out yeah i mean so you know leading to my next question that's an excellent segue um you know can being basically essentially the capstone of the golden dawn system of, of magic uh you've got the nokia con that you're putting on uh this year in vancouver and, and correct me if i'm wrong it's the first of of what will be four yeah, the the theme for these four years, we can we can always have a different theme after that, but let's just get this thing going and see what happens, right? You know, uh, so for the next three years, the goal is to have it in Vancouver and build up to having the fourth year in Prague for John D's five hundredth birthday on July thirteenth. So this year will not be his five hundredth birthday, but we'll have a little birthday party for him here in Vancouver at the conference anyway. And yeah, I, I look forward to uh, also also aiming towards moving a fourth one in Europe allows us the ability to more easily invite the European scholars like Dr. Stephen Skinner and Dr. Egil Asperum and mm. Dr. Georgi Zhinyi. I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the name, but maybe not. Yeah, there, there are uh, some really good, and there's other European experts that would be really great to have involved. So yeah, the idea is just to make events happen now that, now that flights, flight prices have dropped uh, significantly from the last several years. Um, um, you know, uh, it's it's doable to make these things happen and bring people together and and let us uh, share the best of our research and experience with each other that's yeah. the idea so so are you are you a, a bit more of a de purist in your praxis or or have you have you spent any significant amount of time really trying to work the the gd i guess reimagining of the system yeah no uh, like uh like our dear brother aaron leach i sort of stopped with gd and okian at the at the pyramids with the Egyptian gods. I'm sure I'll do them at some point to justify a six, five ceremony, um, or something <laughs> who knows, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but yeah, yeah, no, I, the purism is what, uh, got me and I have a course on it to get more people into it. So you can go to Enochian grimoire.com to get my intro course to de purism, but you know, the purists, 
here's the fun discussion about deep heroism and i like the word traditionalism or traditional approach more but that's vaguer mm -hmm. um with purism purism is definitely includes we've we've decided the the committee met and we took votes and everyone decided that purism does include thelemic practitioners and non-christian practitioners so that means what i'm actually involved in is for lack of a better term dogmatic purism right as in don't throw out d's religion and context um right. so the course i present is not requiring people be christian to do that because you can replace god with mod and you can replace any 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 you could replace jesus christ with mad for the Enochia name for god or whatever other name you do want people do that anyway so it seems silly to be like actually that's not true like you know come on um the the goal is to get people not interested in being a christian Enochian magician heaven forbid but you know you know christ is king <laughs> just joking just joking that that whole internet stuff oh my god <laughs> keep it away from me <laughs> okay keep it <laughs> but the goal is to get people interested in these actual writings and actual original forms of practice that would have been continued by his followers uh quote unquote followers all the way through elias ashmole and maybe peter smart and the other people who kept enochian going because those people that tradition is what led to the cipher manuscripts when the gold everyone's always like it's golden dawn enochian it's like yes the golden dawn created a system of d and kelly's angel magic and they named it enochian magic mm -hmm. which would mean anything that comes after golden dawn enochian would technically be neo enochian mm -hmm. and golden dawn with methodology would be the only technically named Enochian magic if you see what I'm saying with the terminology here I'm Absolutely. giving a little challenge to Aaron Leach's uh categorizations there just to uh <laughs> you know okay I think it's because I think I'm right but um <laughs> you know it doesn't really matter that what matters is where are you getting your sources from and the Golden Dawn got their sources from the cipher manuscripts so the Golden Dawn and Mathers are not the people responsible for saying we're going to divide the tablets like you hear in all these uh everyone say like Mathers is the genius who divided the great table into four tablets and put them on the walls and it's like a little bit but have you read the cipher manuscripts mm -hmm. someone else and dr burns contends that whoever wrote them knew understood the elemental alchemical progression of the golden dawn grades from the monus hieroglyphica of john d and wow. that the monus hieroglyphica in it contains the exact wow. elemental progression and alchemical stages that we see then executed in the golden dawn system via the cipher manuscripts it's very important people not forget the ciphers when looking at the origin of golden dawn stuff and of course skinner's book uh practical angel magic shows the text the original nine thousand word document that may have, was probably d's prayers but then expanded to almost a hundred thousand words and then the golden dawn chunk at the back is this tiny little uh piece but largely that's due to the fact that i think a lot of the gd stuff was burned by temples when they closed that's why we don't have the uh mathers uh, lessons and instructions for adepts on traveling the aethers in the spirit vision or working with the heptarchia as the seven days of creation of course nick farrell's done a wonderful job letting us know that frequent references in golden dawn diary entries show that these lessons did exist they just probably got burned or who knows maybe someone has them mm -hmm. well that's the whole thing right that, that we hope that in 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 future years new evidence comes to light and and there's a lot of private collection sort of stuff, uh, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I think, didn't they, they found like, uh, what they're thinking are Westcott's tablets like this. Uh, I think he did yeah, like Tabby a, did a whole book on it, right? Yeah. He, yeah, exactly. He, the concourse. Yeah, so they're the selling them. They're beautiful. Yeah, I think yeah. they're, they're psychedelic and fun. They found them. Didn't they found that in like a a, a a broom closet in the museum or something like that. So, no. Yeah, I can't remember exactly, but it, the story was like incredible. Like how how did nobody know this was in there? It was literally in like a a museum or something. <laughs> but but the other good thing about the purest approach or the traditional approach to Enochian magic is, um, while the Golden Dawn enochian magic really works well within the system and context of the golden dawn right and and using these elemental 
powers as the cipher manuscripts describe the tablets to be elemental, right? In the tracing of the hierophant shapes and the names called, that's all the cipher manuscripts. Mm -hmm. That wasn't Mathers. So learning that doesn't really introduce you to much other than the Golden Dawn. Doesn't introduce you to what Dee and Kelly were up to. It might, though, be a reflection of the tradition of Enochian angel magic practitioners up until the point of the Golden Dawn. But by taking it back to Dee, of course, the diaries come alive again when you take it back to D and don't just efface it and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter because we've moved on. You might still find some stuff in there, yeah. as many of us are. Uh, like if you want to you want to be a pioneer in any magical discipline, D purism is a good place to go because there's a lot. He was a genius. And he was uh, he's he was he was a fan of hiding things, and he was a fan of word plays, puns, secrets, right? Like even in the Monus Hieroglyphica, one of my favorite parts that Doctor Burns goes over is in the shape of the circle of the of the sun of the monad. D makes reference to ellipses, but then because he references one of them, he asks forgiveness of his majesty for saying this because it shouldn't be known. And that's because he's describing the difference in that symbol in in that sentence between how you use a parabola to chart an accurate firing of a cannonball versus an inaccurate one. And that is actually a secret that he therefore asked forgiveness from the queen for, for writing in this book that so, because some might understand what he's actually saying. And it's like, so he had this multi-layered mind that most of us probably couldn't even begin to fathom. And so looking at Enochian and involving yourself in the practice of Enochian magic from the, that, that a traditional purist perspective not only opens up D and Kelly in a whole new way than that we that we won't even begin to understand publicly for decades, but it opens up grimoire magic because the methods of Enochian are the methods we find in a in a compound version of Trithemian drawing spirits into crystals, the the Ars Arbitel methodology with its strange blend of pagan arc gnostic archon spirits um as the olympics and calvinist theology like calvinist theology and that's fun like who doesn't love calvinism right that's fascinating that's absolutely fascinating i mean the, the, to so me, yeah the the, the 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 some of the most fascinating parts of of not only golden dawn history but generally the occult is uh is is that you know the you know or the angelical the conversations that moment that event that that lasted you know all those years but it it's like it, a lot of people don't realize like how involved d was uh with the history of his era you know working as a as as a spy um and and at also court astrologer to queen elizabeth i mean that's insane um and unofficially unpaid yeah <laughs> well that's kind of the tragedy of d's life oh you know, it's more than a tragedy penniless holy crap a penniless genius you know who like but you know created I, the, the, the british empire oh and d but d was i'm sure there's times he was penniless but he wasn't generally penniless this man you, you all the books the library he collected costed money and reading in the in the biographies about where he got money from and who he borrowed like oh 50 pounds here 50 pounds there it's like if i was calling you up and other people i'd be like hey can i just borrow another like I don't know, 15k 15k 10 5 or 5 is okay but no maybe like 20 20 like you can't he was just doing that and buying this stuff and sometimes the queen definitely gave him money but yeah no official position um in the early years especially and i think that's largely because it was sort of like hey a lot of people thought i should execute you because along you know like your dad and brother but i'm not going to and you owe me you know Right. So it's like that like I've spared your life, you owe me forever and uh and all three scraps. But I don't know, there's a, quite a mystery between especially in those last ten years. I don't know why Queen Elizabeth didn't do what I would consider right by him. Those last ten years are odd. And I, yeah. I'm just reading the Glenn Perry academic biography now, so hopefully I'll have a better understanding there uh, later on. I mean, you know, his associate Edward Kelly and spending all that time and getting getting himself involved in all this political intrigue probably was like, what are you doing? That's the whole thing, you know, he that I love about D is that he really you could tell we like to retro retrospectively paint everybody with the same brush as 
you know, that, that is saturated in our own colors, you know, like nobody believed anything, nobody did anything out of any sincerity other than, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, um, desire to climb the power hierarchy. Uh, we, we, there's lots of TV shows and, 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 uh, sort of, I want to say socio-political uh, philosophy that kind of rearranges, um, everything around that central thing. And, and D I think is a really good example of somebody who did things because he believed in them. Um, and he, he really, really, uh, was, his convictions were so strong that it, it led him to constantly kind of, he, he kept putting his foot in it, especially in the, in the later years, you know, because more like I, end, I think ended up ransacked, right? I mean, his, 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 his books were, a lot of the stuff was stolen or, or it, it, got, it got destroyed. Um, and, and because he was away from home for so long, trying to, he like, wasn't sending money to, uh, his, I believe it's his wife's brother, um, I, or someone like that. He was, he wasn't sending money to them. And so they sold some, a lot of his stuff to pay themselves. And he was gone for many years. Yeah. Crazy. Our minds can't even imagine what that's like. Like, could you imagine like, like, especially with the whole thing going on with, with squatters these days, can you imagine like leaving your home for like 20 years and being like, I, I, I told my neighbor to look after it for me. And he said he would. It's like, did you pay property tax? No. <laughs> yeah. What's that? <laughs> that's like the odyssey. You know, you go away for, <laughs> you come home and there's uh suitors in your house. <laughs> that's, you know, I, I like that. Um, I like that we have a lot in common. I like that you kind of, you know, acknowledge, the Christianity that is is part of the it's part of the contextual basis of 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 you know the angelical sessions and and D and Kelly's work. It's not something that you can easily sidestep while maintaining any any kind of uh, real hold on what was going on. At least initially, right? Like you're saying, you don't necessarily need it uh, in order to work the system. But I think that in order to really contextualize it in a way that makes sense, it's super important. And I was kind of, I was very pleased to hear that, um, you know, I think one of the first things you had mentioned to me when, when you, when we were initially dialoguing was that you're also a Christian yourself. Um, and yeah, I went to a seminary after I closed the temple and got my master's in divinity and, uh, worked for the Anglican church. Uh, I still do sort of para ecclesial work, uh, with, uh, people, um, professionally and that's one of the reasons i use a pseudonym mm, understandable so i mean the the marriage of those two things for you is not incompatible not at all not at all um and what would you define those two things as well that's mainstream the whole thing. religion well because what is I that was... right religion contains its esoteric aspect within it. It contains its mystical theology as a bedrock of its entire tradition. Um, you can go appeal to scripture, you can appeal to tradition, but but that, any denomination you look at, it's going to have all these different elements at it, right? Like, we're looking actually, I think, at the most fertile terrain imaginable for a massive resurgence in American evangelical Christian folk magic. I mean, it's. I think it's already begun. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, all I think a lot of the fundamentalist evangelicals who are railing against demon possessions and and uh, and occultists and and uh, and uh, you know uh, pop stars, uh, you know Taylor Swift doing rituals. You know, the people are like, oh, it's all magic and stuff. Like eventually, they're going to discover the six and seven books of Moses and be like, oh, and we can do it too. <laughs> a lot of them. I think are going to uh, find that out. Someone else, uh, David Rankin also thinks that he thinks the future is going to be very heavily, a big movement of, uh, Psalm psalmody and Psalm based magic in, in the Christian mainstream, perhaps even though I'll, uh, albeit not necessarily mainstream, but who yeah. knows? Well, well, I mean, the thing is that uh, despite, you know, falling st statistics and things like that, Christians still make up like a tremendous percentage of the population of of this of the country that i live in you know um and i live in the south you know i used to live in the north um and christianity is much different down here than it is up there um but that's the whole thing you know people people will message me you know like okay for for easter right uh yesterday i put up you know christ is risen 
Um, and people are like flabbergasted that I'm an occultist and I'm also like, what are, what's going on? Like, is, yeah, they're it, hard on us, aren't they? It's you get it from everywhere because then I'm an occultist and the Christians don't want to talk to me. So, you know, then they find out I'm a Freemason. You know, like, it's just, I, I, I don't, I get, you know, there's, there's no rest, but the, the thing is that it's really to your point, it's, it's not, you know, incompatible, especially when you look at, and I think even in, in, you know, somebody like Walter Honograph, who's, who's very, very, he, you know, he's academic about it, but he talks about it sympathetically and, and realistically without this kind of this bias of wanting to whitewash mainstream religions out of it. Like the, like what we consider occultism today had its foundations in mainstream religions. It did not exist outside of, 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 of mainstream religions, you know, like the Western esoteric traditions as they've been handed down to us um, are firmly implanted within, you know, that, that milieu. Um, granted, they might've been on the peripheries, but they, they would have had no germinative area. They would have had no seed ground uh, to, to sprout up. And, 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 and I mean, like I look at my uh, up, up north, you know, the Sicilian grandmother who prays to saints if she needs to find things or if she's in trouble. I mean, it's kind of magic, you know. So it's it's these things I think are very compatible. And I I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on on you know like your commentary on that. I mean, do you get that too? Do people kind of bust your chops about that? Oh, absolutely. It was uh, as I, I announced my return to uh, the uh, culture at, in 2018 with my appearance at the Berlin Culture Conference and. Uh, you know, with my priest collar on and everything, performed a you know Kabbalistic cross with my the four Enochian tablets being held by attendees around me, and those were the same tablets from the original temple of 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 uh, uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn International from Cherry Lane down in L.A. Like Zinc's original tablets made by Lisa, who has recently passed, unfortunately. So those tablets are still at my friend's temple, the the, the one of the the offshoot chief temples in england so you know that was my announcement back to the scene people were very shocked to see the caller and to hear about my background and i was surprised that they were shocked because i was like i thought that's why my application was accepted because it was kind of far out and like oh is this this person really exists they were lacking in hermetic uh, presentations and stuff and yeah um so it's it's shocking it's shocking to i guess some people to discover that there's this magical tradition within the christian churches and uh that's just a lack of education and again i think hanegraaff talks about that in esotericism and the academy and how how since the enlightenment these things just sort of slowly got shoved off and discredited even though they came from mainstream sources dr puka's recent really excellent video on cataphatic practices cataphatic spirituality in the christian church identifying it as far back as the 12th century christian pietism right like so those practices then that were very common then make their way into things like scott's discovery of witchcraft which then make their way into you and i tracing pentagrams in the air um <laughs> right these are not newfangled new age ideas like people like yeah. to criticize you know, like detractors of our tradition like john r king the third and and others who like to you know crap on the golden dawn they're just ignorant as to the historical roots our tradition springs from right grimoire purists who say oh no you must work within this grimoire and this is the best grimoire and i have the only unpublished copy from uh, this manuscript you know that was in prince's vault with all his unreleased albums um <laughs> you know look at that's it it's been debunked and most people know that now right they know that the pgm exists they know that a lot of the gd rituals are from this syncretic tradition that is far more ancient than perhaps even the solomonic in its normally recognized form so yeah lots of fun to be had and and i think your grandma praying to a saint to find her keys is literally just as christian as me wearing doing uh putting on an anubis god form to find my keys you know because christ is king right <laughs> it's so funny because you said that before and i just pictured candace owens working the Eno the enochian tab tablets <laughs> I couldn't well, with get AI, image. we could make that real. I couldn't get out of my head. <laughs> I can't believe someone said the name Candace Owens to me on a podcast. That's something I, I've said a lot of crazy things on podcasts. 
uh, that's actually crazier. I don't even know what to say. It, anyway. Yeah, man. It's uh, it, well, I'll definitely it'll definitely affect the algorithm. That's for sure. <laughs> We've got, we've got, we've got her. We've got Christ. I mean, this will get like nine views. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I love it. I love it. This, I love is great, it. Yeah. this is a great combo, man. Um, you know, I I want to ask you this, and this might be a little redundant because we've talked about it a lot. We spent almost a half hour talking before. I'll find I a new way to answer it then. Recording, but 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 I want to ask you the the question you know since you've had that interview um if any of your thoughts have kind of like changed or anything like that but you asked uh lon duquette um why he thought magic was having such a comeback these days and so why do you think that magic right forget golden dawn because the people in golden dawn we've been doing it for a long time you know and and uh especially you like hats off <laughs> um because it's commitment right a lot of people don't stick around one thing for that long um you know uh but so what are you what are your thoughts uh maybe i don't know uh sociologically metaphysically what are you thinking what's the purpose the telos maybe behind mm. this this resurgence of magic you know well i've never been one to really have any kind of perusial expectations of some epic event or return whether it's the return of christ or some black swan nightmare whatever that, that would be like i like to imagine i was a big fan when i when i was a when i actually had time and young and and those carefree days of summer childhood you know and playing second edition shadow run I always had this sense intuitively that the world would go into some sort of like cyber future you know and that this i had this sort of vision or image in my mind that the idea that like because we were all terrified of y2k right everyone's like y2k y2k i even first year college in magazine article writing class i wrote for uh, my professor an article that i still like actually it's called y2k did you forget your umbrella and it's just all about like demons falling from the sky and you know you got to have your umbrella and all the different uses an umbrella will have i never read douglas adams i've never read douglas adams or anything like that i was just that was just sort of my style of writing naturally as a kid and uh and he liked that a lot because they, we, everyone was terrified we shut down all of our vancouver two year 2000 celebrations in vancouver and had a vigil of light with candles near science world and it was so sad buses were getting shut down because someone would forget their backpack it's like oh we're all gonna die right and we had to sit there in vancouver and watch as the other time zones across from like you know from like russia moscow fireworks and dancing vienna fireworks and dancing or waltzing france fireworks and dancing america fireworks dancing and gun violence and then get to toronto and it's like you know fireworks and and uh i don't know what torontonians are like but then it gets to vancouver and it's like you see this image on the news and it's like really dark because nothing's happening and there's some buildings around them and then you see some flickers of light and it's like yeah this, this is 60 people that showed up to our city's event for the year 2000 and there's a reason so that's if you ever hear people refer to our city as, as no fun Coover, that's sort of part of the reason why the city has, our city has a problem with fun, but the people don't. And we, we, we do want to, to, we have been, we used to be the most artistic city in Canada. We had the top amount of artists in Canada with the second highest per capita being Victoria, just on Vancouver Island. So our province had the two highest cap per capita collections of artists since the Olympics, it's gone down to it's just become garbage. They just destroyed a city. The cost, like, you know, artists can't afford 3500 for a bachelor suite, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, and there's just, yeah. So it's really, uh, I think it's those times. It's these these end time mentalities. And then when the end times doesn't happen, it creates this new questioning. And we see this, I think, in other centuries as well with uh, when you sort of look at the uh, upspring of, of, religious movements and spiritual beliefs and different traditions right there's the one before the millennium and the one after the millennium and then there's sort of this dead zone in the middle it seems like to me though the more i learn about history the more i realize maybe that's just never the case honestly if i was to give a, an answer like speaking academically um though maybe that's not true i don't know i just said that but like if i was to answer it to academics i would say i suspect that this tradition has always been just as lively and prominent as it is now it's just 
been documented well or poorly or marginalized more or less at certain times. But I don't think that the quantity of people really has changed. That's not to say this is, but this is what we're going through now is totally different. This occult revolution and what's causing that, well, um, disempowering people. Yeah, mm -hmm. disempowering people, taking their autonomy away from them and you know, putting them under the, the boot on their neck. That's going to make people, magic is there for, is I in my experience, magic is best at doing things that you can't do in any other way. Mm -hmm. That's why people who do magic try to make a living off doing magic for money literally aren't going to ever succeed at that. You can't, you can't live off praying at an altar for money or doing spells for money. Um, well, unless you're a service and selling it as a service, I suppose. And I do appreciate the people that do that. Actually, sometimes it's nice to, you know, avail yourself. <laughs> like when you're putting on a big event yeah ah, yeah there you go <laughs> well why don't you is there anything else that you can tell us about the the enochia con um you know uh maybe the dates and 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 some of the people i mean are you you're giving a presentation right yeah of course of course yeah i have a i've made a remarkable discovery that will change the face of enochian magic for all of time oh boy so yeah. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to tease it here. <laughs> we should, we, you know, I mean, well, I mean, you could, I, I, I literally have run my discovery by, um, well, I needed some help and I got advice and then I took the advice and then the person said, actually ignore that advice. Let me help you some more. And so that was Joseph Peterson, who of course is nothing, if nothing but helpful. And, uh, he helped me confirm that what I found was indeed what I thought it was. And then I passed it by Dr. Burns to see what she thought. She thought it was significant. And then I passed it by uh, Dr. Angela Puka to see what she thought. And she thought that it was uh, something I could get published academically. So that's what I'm going to do wow. with my little discovery. But you guys will hear about it first at the conference before I submit the article to uh, to an academic journal. So, yeah, I, I'm very excited for my presentation. I don't actually expect to do, I wasn't going to do a presentation this year, but then it turned out I had a reason to. Um, I was just going to put on the event because I want these things to happen. And if we don't make them happen, they're just never going to happen. And so I'm excited to, uh, to yeah, to have something to contribute. And after, you know, to almost 30 years of, of studying Enochian and magic and practicing it in varying degrees uh, over time, it's like pretty cool when you actually observe something that is significant because usually that just means that you have to have so much familiarity with your field that you know what is significant yes other people have seen what i've seen they just didn't click how important it was so that's what i'll be presenting on there's going to be a lot of great presenters there we're doing it the weekend of course of july 12th to 14th in vancouver canada but it's also a cyber conference everything's online it's all the same price and uh, that's because people traveling here have to pay for travel and that's expensive and we have great presenters. Uh, you yourself applied and you're presenting yourself and it would be cool to have you on the podcast sometime later this month to talk about it. But we do have till the fourth of this month uh, a payment plan available so you can pay the uh, the over three months rather than pay all at once for those who want to do that. And you should do that because it will support us and make it possible to make this thing fully happen. If it has to be just an online conference, then it will be. But it will be a physical in-person conference eventually, if not this year, then others. And I trust the magic being done i trust the readings we've done i think things are going to work out fine but please do support it if you want to see more physical events happen see more bridges being uh, built between practitioners and academics sharing of information there's just so much that we could do in this life if we if we are willing to put in the work to uh, you know get out of our homes and go do it yeah that's a good point especially now especially now especially now, now. Do it now before it's right but in 2006 my buddy had a friend who was said he was closing down 11 mines and my buddy said why he said because there's something coming spend your money while it's still worth something and then the 2008 crash happened right and i hear a lot of people saying like look if you want to go on a cruise if you want to go see italy if you want to go find yourself in nepal or visit new zealand do it now yeah. right because we don't actually know what's going to happen and there's definitely a dark forces at play mm, well said well said my friend um so where where can they where can they go to to check it out what's the website enochiacon.com e-n-o-c-h 
A-R-C-H-I-C-O-N.com. And you can also check out, it's the same uh, website as arcaneresearchsociety.com. Arcaneresearchsociety.com. Both both take you to the same place. Um, and we, yeah, so we're doing it as a private group. So we have access to better venues and better prices and uh, also avoid the uh, whole public scrutiny of people who would just try and get it canceled before it happens. Cause that is, I know so many friends who like, as soon as they announce an event, people are calling the venue and trying to get it canceled just cause they have nothing else to do with their lives. And they're just pathetic, miserable people. And there's a lot of people I know who are doing that to uh, occultists these days. It's very common. I, I, I deal with stuff like that all the time. You know, Dr. Puka had her whole channel DDS attacked and stuff like massive. There's, there's horrible, horrible attacks against occultists. And like Justin Sledge was saying on his channel, there's like outright bigotry and, and prejudice against any of us from alternative religions or spiritualities of that aren't the approved sort. Yeah. Right. And so we have a, an uphill battle. And, and I think the best thing we can do is create our own, uh, fortify our own connections and and uh, and events and make them fun. I'm also excited to do an event where academics and practitioners are can both mix. And that's with that as the premise of the event, no one's going to have a problem with it, right? My time going to academic conferences, it was always in hushed tones. We would talk about actual spiritual experience or spiritual practices, and we would uh, we would make sure we did that away from a lot of other people. And yeah, so that's important. Doing work. something different. That's yeah work. I really I respect that. I'm really happy to be a part of the uh, the conference, not just because of that, but that's a, that's a huge factor. Um, I'm really glad that that you got to. Uh, come on today as you, as you probably know i give everybody a couple canned questions at the end of the conversation so anybody for anybody that's listening to this podcast today we've talked about golden dawn we've talked uh about um uh, john d we've talked about enochian versus the angelic magic but what three books could you recommend to anybody who wants to get a foot in the door and and learn a little bit more expand on what we talked about today You've got a lot behind you, so <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, can you can you narrow it down at all? Yeah, maybe like uh, a really. Well, if you're interested reason. in Enochian magic, this is the first place to start. I would say Th these diaries are not the full John D and Edward Kelly diaries, but they are the beginning. And more excitingly than anything else, I could say about them is the new edition from Joseph Peterson comes out this August, which will oh. be expanded, presumably with information from the. Um, uh, the document released last year from the British Library that had a different version of the uh, Heptarchia. So the Exerciti to Heptarchia manuscript should add some new information. I don't really know what he's doing exactly. As soon as he helped me out, actually, we he just we discovered he, he played Celtic music as well. So after that, Peterson and I just talked about Irish hand drums and fiddles, and I, that's all we talk about now. So um, I hoped we could have an Enochian dialogue, but unfortunately, Celtic music trumps even. In Okeana. So a new edition of this coming out. Um, and uh, that's very, a, very much a good place to, if you're reading the diaries as well, I recommend when you're reading the interactions, read them out loud. Same, same rule as poetry. Um, and, and then after that, of course, the second set of diaries is, is published by Skinner with all the Latin translations. And uh, you can get that on Amazon in a slightly uh, different form, but same book. And just reading them is very interesting, in my opinion. So there's some uh, some Enochian stuff. What else could I recommend? Is there like one um, that you is there, is there one you'd you'd give to somebody that's interested in Golden Dawn or? Yeah, well, what do we got? Here, I've never shown this before to anyone. Ooh, this is one of the rare first editions. Oh wow, that's awesome! What is this? You'll also. Um, yeah. So Yeah. This is from 1994 and this is a limited first edition of Bam. Oh wow. Yeah. That's great. Yep. Bone Dawn Rituals. Yeah, Padzaleski. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh I can see why he reprinted it because this is missing about 60 pages. Really? 
as like uh, just a printing error? Um, I don't know. Uh, another chunk of the pages, uh, once you get to the next number, start going in reverse order. So it's a, uh, it's definitely a novelty item. Wow. Very cool. Very but, cool. But that book has be I I pointed out not just to show a make a joke and show a novelty production of a, a legendary text, but the new edition is out, published by Nick Farrell. And the Golden Dawn Rituals and Commentaries is definitely the place you want to read first if you're a Golden Dawn person. The Regardi Black Brick later on, I would say with and this and the Cicero books, but that represents a pre regardy tradition of the GD before that's more full. It's just more full. And uh, you get to, you know, Nick uh, Pat Zaleski tells his story of how he, how he found them and all of that. And it's really interesting. So yeah, you can check out from Lord Manticore press, uh, Nick Farrell's publication of Pat Zaleski's golden dawn rituals and commentary. The newest edition is the best edition. Um, it's very big and uh, yeah. Definitely a certainly a good compliment to the the GD Black Brick by Regardi. Yeah. I love I love Pat's take on on uh energetics, you know, uh and his experience as a martial artist and stuff like that, bringing that into uh the temple because I, I as I mentioned earlier, you know, Taoism and Qigong and stuff like that, that's been a twin a parallel trajectory uh with Golden Dawn magic for me. So yeah, I I mean that's a great recommendation all your recommendations and all the I volumes could, you have are awesome <laughs> if i could only have two books on a desert island they would have to be these two my first edition of the Kabbalion and the best magic book ever written <laughs> oh, wait so why do you have a that's why, an inside joke yeah what why do you why do you have a first edition of the Kabbalion? it was given to me in 1997 when i went for my Zelator initiation in LA by my friend uh Fredder Fredder C. You can see it's inscribed to me from that day in August 1997. Wow. I wow. Yeah. There you go. I made him sign it to me and he asked why. He said he didn't want to sign it because it was a first edition. And I said, Well, that way I can never sell it. And I'm glad I did make him do that because I totally would have sold it by now otherwise. P I've had people offer me 10 grand for this. Like it's just it's yeah, first edition. I was about to say you have like a mini Mort Lake going on there. I did. I actually had a much large. I had a very large. All of these, all of this library, almost without exception, is very new since I, most of it since COVID. Um, I had a six thousand book library before that, but I had a, a a massive robbery by one of Griffin's members and lost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of property, which he's currently selling online. You can buy my old stolen books currently online from from uh, Dean McNeil. Oh my God. That's awful. Yeah. That is awful. Yeah, I don't know why the police think it's okay, but apparently they support criminals now over citizens, and that's the way of the world. Yes, that's definitely going on. And I'm not just saying that to be yeah. cute. They literally said that. Yeah. Yeah, but no. I, I believe it's it. really weird. I don't understand what's going on anymore. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, man. I am right there with you. It's what it is. It's beyond wild. We have stepped into, and that's you know that kind of goes back to the whole thing with magic coming to the fore again. Um, but is there anything else that you want to uh, you want to plug? You want people to know about or anything at the well, moment? Well, obviously, everyone needs to get Samuel Scarborough's complete flying rolls. You want to understand what Golden Dawn Adepts magic actually looked like in practice? You need to read these. Yes. Right? It might be hard to understand on its own terms uh, in isolation from everything else, but but it's a, yeah. Yeah, it's very good. That's excellent. I agree with that. I, I appreciate you uh, coming on today, and um, I'm looking forward, really, honestly, to, to many future conversations, man. Um, I feel like... Uh, I'm just happy that we met and um, I'm looking forward Likewise. to see, seeing you in July. Yeah. And we'll I, maybe, you know, at a future podcast, we'll dive a little bit more into music because that's, I mean, that's a common, another area of, of common ground. Well, let's have you, uh, let's have you on mine uh, on this month. Let's have you on mine this month and uh, we'll talk about your presentation. You can tell people about what you're going to bring to the conference and that's going to be very exciting. We could, we could, we could do a, a magic without fears, classic, 
classic long haul three four hour one if you want like the the records held by lenny peterson at just over six hours right so that's insane i'm sure i'll never do that again in my life but i would but maybe maybe i don't know but uh it is fun to to spend a long time and really dive into these things i have fans who still tell me that they only listen to the podcasts i do that are over three hours it's like if it doesn't hit the three hour mark it's like just not a waste of time <laughs> i'm like you're killing me but god bless you i feel the same way about a lot of things like you know um i just yeah life's busy again now i'm, I'm we're all back at life so yeah, there's just not necessarily time to always do those 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 same deep dives. I was very happy when you applied because I reached out to you just to see if you'd have me on because I loved your Dr. Sledge interview so much. I thought you did that, handled that with, you really got out of him some stuff I have not seen him, a side of him that I've not seen him express in that way. And it was really a heartwarming and showed his, I think he showed his humanity and his intellectual integrity in a way that a lot of people might not appreciate if they're just watching his, his the content he puts out um yeah so i hope people i hope a lot i hope that's a very popular episode because it should be yeah and yeah. uh and with them when so yeah i just reached out to be on because i wanted to to talk to you and be on your podcast and then you applied and i was so so excited that you did that's really wonderful i'm i i look forward to showing you this beautiful amazing city um of vancouver this summer yeah i'm looking forward to it thanks for coming on my pleasure Thank you.